All right, well, welcome and good evening, everybody. We are so glad that you can join us for our first patient webinar of the year. We're very glad that you can join us. Uh, I guess it's a little late to be saying Happy New Year, but it's the first time we're seeing you uh, during the webinar. So Happy New Year to you all. We hope everybody is uh, having a wonderful new year and is doing uh, is healthy. Um, we're excited that you can join. My name is Michael York, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Um, if at any point you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and enter those into the chat and Q&A function down below and at the bottom of your screen. We'll go ahead and address those questions at the end of the presentation, just because sometimes those questions can be answered throughout. Um, and we have a great one on hand for you today. It is entitled, Do I Have Glaucoma? And is presented to you by Dr. Yi Lan Wong, who is our glaucoma and cataract specialist here at Harvard Eye. Um, she has obviously an extensive knowledge on tonight's topic, and we're very excited to have her uh, presenting and at Harvard Eye. Uh, Dr. Wong attended the University of Rochester, where she received her undergrad degree, and then she received her medical degree from Duke University. Uh, Dr. Wong conducted her ophthalmology residency at the Stein Eye Institute at UCLA and then moved across the country to uh, Miami where she attended the renowned Baskin Palmer Eye Institute for her glaucoma fellowship um, at the University of Miami. So um, obviously, like I said, uh, extensive background on glaucoma uh, and we're so very happy to have her presenting with us tonight. So um, without further ado, I will hand things off to Dr. Wong. Hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Wong. I'm one of the, like Michael said, I'm one of the glaucoma specialists at Harvard Eye. Um, I do glaucoma and cataract care for all of my patients. I'm hoping I'm, you know, talking to some of my patients now at this webinar. And I'd like to welcome you guys and thank you for spending an hour with us tonight um, via Zoom on this, um, you know, workday evening. Um, so uh, spending, you know, your important time with us. So. I'd like to also say Happy New Year. I know it's towards the end of January, but it's still the beginning of Lunar New Year. So if you're celebrating Lunar New Year to Year Rabbit this year, Happy New Year to you. Um, this is our first uh, patient education seminar this year in 2023. I can't believe it. It's It's been so long since we did it in person. So um, we've moved to virtual platform ever since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's with a blink of an eye, it's almost four years now. I like to think I'm the best out of everybody at Harvard Eye. That's why I get to talk first this year. Um, but in fact, it's actually January is uh, Glaucoma Awareness Month. So that's why we think it would be a good time to actually talk to you all about a little bit more about glaucoma. I'm sure some of my patients, you know, some of our glaucoma patients that we take care of at Harvard Eye already know what glaucoma is. So some of this might be refreshing your memory, um, but hopefully it helps all of us to kind of, you know, get you on the same page and understand what this disease is about and what it's about taking care of it. All right, so we're going to get started. Glaucoma is a leading cause of blindness, and it's important to remember it is a irreversible blindness for people over the age of 60. Uh, when my patients come to me for evaluation of glaucoma, getting the consultation, do I have glaucoma? Uh, I always tell them that your risk do increase exponentially the moment you hit the age of 60. It is mostly an aging problem. So as we get older, unfortunately, um, like the high blood pressure, like the sugar issue, cholesterol issue, joint issue, skin issue, all of the uh, glaucoma is part of an aging issue as well, similar to cataract. But the difference and which is the importance of glaucoma is that if you got damage from glaucoma, it's not reversible, which is why we like to make it more aware for everybody and uh, increase that awareness so we can work together to protect your vision from this horrible disease. Um, so like I said, January is Glaucoma Awareness Month. Um, over 60 million people worldwide have glaucoma. That is a, a large number. And half of them, which is you know sad and also unfortunate, that half of these people actually do not know they have it. Which is why when you go to your optometrist nowadays for glasses and um, even for a simple eye issue, you actually, some of you might get surprised when they tell you, hey, I think you should get checked for glaucoma because all the doctors now are working together to screen people for glaucoma precisely for, the, for this reason. Because glaucoma is known as to be 
the um, silent theft of vision. It doesn't really announce it's there, which is why half of the people who have them don't know they have it. And it really um, needs the doctor to do the screening work to do to run all the testing, do a, do a thorough exam of your eye in order to answer the question, do I have glaucoma? And in fact, the World Health Organization estimated that 4.5 million people worldwide are blind due to glaucoma. So if you do a quick math, 4.5 out of 60, that's actually, you know, one in 100, a little bit over 100, maybe 120 um, people will be blind for people who have glaucoma. So that's uh, not, that's not a, a very high odd, but it's compared to many other diseases, rare diseases, glaucoma is fairly common and blindness in glaucoma is not something that's like completely impossible. It's not that rare, it do happen. So if you have glaucoma, like again, the math is if you do have glaucoma, one in every 120 people who have glaucoma may end up going blind from it. More than 3 million people in the United States have glaucoma. This is now we're narrowing down the statistics to just the United States. Earlier, we were talking about worldwide. And um, the National Eye Institute of the United States projects this number um, to reach 4.3 million by 2030. So we're 2023 now, seven years from now, we're going to have another 1.3 million people. So almost a third. So 58% of increase from 2010. It's a huge increase, not because there's something out there in the water or in the air, the pollution, or and you can think of that's creating more glaucoma. I think the majority of this is the aging general um, population is aging more and more more older people, people are living longer. So things deteriorate as we age. And so is glaucoma um, happening more. This is putting the statistics we talked about in the United States um, onto the timeline table for you. Going back to 2010, which is about 13 years ago, 2.7 million people in the United States had glaucoma possibly. And um, in seven years in 2030, that's going to increase to 4.3 million. So um, almost a 2 million increase, like a 1.6 million. And then another 20 years down the road, you're gonna have two more million on top of the 4.3 million, which is a lot. So what exactly is glaucoma? Why we're spending this whole hour dedicated to talk about what is glaucoma? And um, why is it such a scary disease? Glaucoma actually is a disease that affects the optic nerve of the eye. And like I said earlier, it's called the silent death of sight. We have an optic nerve behind each eyeball. It's not something you can touch. It's not something you could see. It takes a good dilated exam of your eye for a doctor to use a special mirror or lens in front of your eye in order to bring out the optic nerve. And even then we're not really looking at the whole optic nerve. We're only looking at a cross section of the optic nerve. So optic nerve is actually like many other nerves of the body is a type of nerve. It's one of the larger nerves in the body. It's a thick bundle made of millions of tiny little fibers. So it's a long course that runs behind each eyeball and links the eyeball to the top of the brain. So it does literally what a cable does to send thick signals back and forth. So that's how we see. So I wanna show you on this illustration to tell you what optic nerve, it's probably better understanding it uh, if you have something to look at. We're looking at an eyeball from a cross section. The front curve here is the cornea. That's the clear part of the eye where people wear their contact lens. And then behind that, I'm, we're seeing like a, um, a, a, a colored part of the eye, which is um, the iris. So I have brown eyes, so my iris is brown, and some people have blue eyes, other people have green eyes, so their iris would be in that color. Behind that is the lens, which is what turns into, uh, turn into cataract. And then so we're basically now seeing the whole eyeball in the frown in almost like a perfect ball shape. Behind that, there's this thick cable. And in between the nerves actually runs the vessels, the vein and the artery that provides the circulation or blood um, supply to the eye. So surrounding the blood vessels is the nerve. 
Basically, it's a thick bundle made of millions of little fibers. And in the very middle of it runs the blood vessels that provides uh, uh, nutrition to the eye. So um, it is responsible for carrying images from the eye to the brain. So any motion we see, any color we see, texture, um, you know, depth perception, all is a signals received by the eye translated into a little electrical signal. And then through this optic nerve cable, it's perceived by the brain. And then that's translating into an image. Um, vision loss is then um, can happen as a result of the nerve damage because we're not sending enough signal. So the cable is not working, sending whatever signal the eye captures to the brain. This is a side view to, to look at um, another way basically of looking at the optic nerve. We're on the right panel, my right. Um, if you're staring at the screen on the right side of the screen, um, the little circle, like a donut shaped structure is the nerve. And like I pointed out earlier, in the middle of it is this vessel that provides the uh, blood um, supply to the eye. So it runs right in the middle of the nerve. Everything else here is the nerve tissue. If you're looking at it from a side view, all these yellow lines is basically illustrating what the nerve fibers are. And all of this color, pink, yellowish color is the thick bundle. And here in the very middle of it runs the blood vessel. So this is the front of the eye. Here is the back of the eye. And if you have high pressure from the front, it causes it literally press onto the nerve and wear off the nerve tissue. So this is another way of showing up the same idea. If you have buildup of fluid in your eye, you have these um, uh, pressure exerting damage onto the nerve, which again is linking the back of the eye to the brain. All of that is making this nerve right here blown up in a magnified um, picture, of getting too much damage and will, will eventually lose its function over time. How does pressure build up in the eye? So normally our eye makes a fluid called the aqueous, um, which is basically a type of uh, fluid that contains lots of nutrition, providing that to the different structures of the eye. The eye constantly makes new ones and the old ones after it circles through the different structures of the eye needs to find a way to go out. Our eye is built with a natural drainage channel Literally, it's a network of different channels collecting all these used aqueous fluid and it's in charge of get rid of them. Basically drain it all out through the outs from the inside to the outside of the eye. And this is completely different from your cheer system. This fluid is not something you could touch. It's not something you could feel. It's literally made within the eyeball itself, kind of isolated from everything else, but it has its own way of being made and its own way of being drained away. When this drainage angle is having issue where the channels are not open enough for the fluid to go through, this outflow process is not as efficient. So we end up having new things being made, old things not draining out. So you have a lot of overflow problem causing too much fluid in the eye, which then translates to high pressure in the eye. And that high pressure will cause, like I said earlier, damage the optic nerve and making the nerve literally thinner and thinner over time. What does it mean when a nerve is thin? What kind of symptoms would you feel? What's the consequence? When you have severe glaucoma, and that is um, when you actually start to have symptoms, I will tell you a little bit more about how symptoms develop in glaucoma, but uh, in a nutshell, in early stages, the borderline stage, the mild stage, or even sometimes the moderate stage of glaucoma, people don't necessarily have any symptoms. I usually tell people you don't want to have symptoms. If you already have symptoms, you likely have severe stage of glaucoma. So this picture shows us what can be potentially symptoms in glaucoma, which is large patches or small patches of gray area or black area or blind spots that you're not seeing. The one on the right side is actually more typical of how glaucoma can develop. You can see, ignoring the big arc of black in the middle, you can see this um, larger rim of blackness uh, around this picture. 
this black area is trying to show you the effect of tunnel vision, like you're looking through a tube. You're not seeing anything towards the side or in your peripheral vision. Eventually, it, that, um, black, the black spot or um, blind spots can happen in the middle of your vision as well, typically in an arc-like shape, eventually take away your middle vision or center vision. This is less typical for people to start realizing there is an arc or a black spot in right in the middle of the vision without losing peripheral vision first. It's less likely. Very, very few people have these kind of symptoms, but we still see that. Majority of the patient lose their vision actually from the periphery. Periphery vision is something we don't notice, but we use all the time. For example, right now, if you're staring at a computer screen, listening to the, into the talk, you probably see what's right in front of you, which is this picture I'm showing you, very clear. But you probably also notice without turning your head that you have something towards your left, you have something towards your right in the room. Maybe it's your couch, maybe it's a light that you see, but you don't need to necessarily turn your head to look for those things. You can probably see the lamp on the roof or in the ceiling. You probably see the fan on the ceiling or see a mat on the floor. So those are things you can notice without turning your head using your peripheral vision. When we're driving or walking, we use our peripheral vision a lot as well. That's something that really puts your body in space so you don't bump into things. Driving especially, you don't want to merge into a lane that's full of cars. So you use your peripheral vision to gauge whether it's a good time to merge. So um, peripheral vision, even though it's not the critical vision we use for you know, reading a book or looking at a cell phone or even driving, looking at the street signs or traffic light, it is something that's more important than we think or we realize. It puts your body in space. People without peripheral vision tend to bump into things or trip um, or even have gaze issues. They don't know where to actually put the next step on because they can't put their body in the space. Um, so that's actually a, a very serious issue. Lots of people with severe glaucoma or even just moderate stage of glaucoma end up having gaze balance issue, and uh, which in elderly people is really bad because you can really encounter a fall if you have a hip dislocation or a fracture somewhere in your bone that takes a lot longer to heal and lots of complications can happen with that as well. So super important to pay attention to your peripheral vision and not to ignore it. Um, like I said, other than peripheral vision loss, which doesn't even you know, come to your attention until the very severe stage when it starts to take over part of your um, center vision, there are no obvious symptoms associated with glaucoma. And once vision is lost, it's permanent. That's the important part I want to highlight to you guys. Despite it being peripheral vision, not the vision we use every single minute for clarity, once that peripheral vision is lost, it's permanent. And as much as 40% of the vision can be lost without anyone noticing anything. So um, again, which all these, what I'm trying to tell you is you won't know if you have glaucoma. So screening for glaucoma may be with your optometrist or with one of our ophthalmologists or glaucoma specialist. It's extremely important. Who gets glaucoma is the next question you'll ask me. Do everybody walking on the street need to have a screening? or if you have certain risk factors that you're, you should get screened more often. So the risk factors that make you more likely to have glaucoma include age over 40, so older people. And like I said earlier, if your um, age is above 60, your risk increases even more. Family history is another high risk factor. So if you have any family member, especially any direct family member, including your parents, your children, your siblings, and your risk are much higher. Ethnicity or um, your racial group is, more is also important. African, Hispanic, or Asian heritage definitely increase your risk. So actually you can roughly gauge that by skin color. Darker skin people are more likely to get glaucoma compared to um, lighter skin color. Um, other factors that is uh, within your eyeball, um, eye characteristics can increase your risk would include high eye pressure. If you were ever told that your pressure seems to run high, that's a risk factor. 
if you have extreme farsightedness, for example, you needed to wear reading glasses in grade school, or extreme nearsightedness, you needed to wear glasses to see the board since you were in middle school, those are likely extreme farsightedness or nearsightedness. If you had eye injury, someone poked you, I'm not talking about a tiny scratch I might have had when I wiped my eyes the other way with a napkin, not that kind of injury, but you know, I got poked in the eye with a sharp object, which requires an emergency uh, room visit, or I got a punch in the eye, um, or I had a baseball hit me right in the eye, I blocked out. That kind of eye injury is um, definitely increases your risk of developing glaucoma. It doesn't, it may not be necessarily right there and then you start to notice problem, it increases your risk for your entire life. So this could be an eye injury you unfortunately sustained when you were three years old, your older sibling poked you in the eye with a pencil, you ended up losing a lot of vision in the eye, that was your lazy eye. It actually, your risk remains until you get much, the whole time, including when you're much older, even if you didn't have any issue in the, in the meantime. If your cornea is thin, that also increases your risk. Not to say that thin cornea makes you have glaucoma. It's not a causative relationship. It's more so that if you have thin cornea, when I check your eye pressure, your eye pressure tend to be underestimated. So for example, if your true eye pressure is 19 and you have thin cornea, when I measure it, it may only reach out a 16 or 15. So it's underestimating that nine, actual number 19, which means we would think you're safe because your pressure is not too high, but in fact, your pressure is actually high, which eventually can get higher and cause more issue. Optic nerve can be another thing that's born to be thin. So just like some people are born taller, other people are born shorter, some people are born with curly hair, other people have straight hair, this is just part of you. You may be born with slightly thinner nerves, still within the average range, but on the lower end, but with time, wear and tear will make that nerve thinner and thinner and eventually get to a critical point where it starts to give you a problem. So um, that's the only way to find out whether you have thin cornea, whether you have thin optic nerve, whether you have extreme farsightedness, nearsightedness, high eye pressure. Actually, it's not something you would know. You would know if when you had eye injury, but um, the rest of it will require an office visit for either optometrist or ophthalmologist to take a look and let you know. Other additional risks that you may have, which involves the rest of the body, would include diabetes, which actually is a very bad disease that causes damage to all the small vessels around your body, including your heart, your kidney, your other nerves, um, like some people have neuropathy when they have diabetes, and as well as the nerve of the optic nerve and the vessels within the eyeball. So if you have bleeding in the eye, you have swelling in the eye, all the treatment associated with that can increase your risk of having glaucoma as well, including diabetes itself. High blood pressure, migraines, poor blood circulation. If you're one of those that constantly have cold hands and feet, if your um, you know, lips turn white um, right away without, you know, in the cold weathers without any uh, good circulation, that's another risk factor for having glaucoma. That's actually your nerve not getting enough of blood circulation, just like everyone else of the body, including your digits, um, that increases the risk of it not having enough nutrition and causing uh, damage like that. Other health problems that may affect the whole body would, um, I would want to especially highlight autoimmune conditions. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, lupus or MS or any other fancy diseases like that require you to be on systemic treatment to reduce inflammation. Inflammation itself increases your risk of having um, glaucoma and the treatment for inflammation, including steroid use, will also increase your risk of having glaucoma. Um, I uh, even made a separate um, bullet point for steroid use. I want to highlight that long term steroid use, usually I mean steroid drops directly onto the eye or steroid cream you use around the eyeball. Um, steroid you take by mouth, like prednisone you have to take for your COPD or prednisone you have to take for a recent COVID flare-up, those don't really count as a major risk factor. We see uh, actually lower association between pill form steroid to high eye pressure because it's not directly applied to the eye. 
But that's not to say there is no risk. It's always good to ask your doctor for their opinion or having an eye pressure check if you're using those long term. Are there different types of glaucoma? Of course, there are many types of glaucoma. This glaucoma is actually a very special specialty that is one disease made of the entire um, specialty. You know, think of a retina specialist. They take care of retinal detachment, macular degeneration, swelling in the retina, bleeding on the retina, all kinds of problems happening to the retina or the eye. But glaucoma is one specialty dealing with just glaucoma, one type of disease. Imagine you have a dry eye doctor, right? Like an ophthalmologist who only takes care of dry eyes. Very rare that we have um, people like that. So it really highlights the importance and complicated um, fact um, nature of glaucoma is that there's so many different subtypes of glaucoma, hence different types of management. So it's super important to find the right specialist to treat your glaucoma because you want to know what type of glaucoma you have and whether you're under the correct treatment for all of that. So the most common type of glaucoma happens in the United States, primary open angle glaucoma. Under that, there is a small group of people that may fall into the category of glaucoma suspect. I see a lot of people as glaucoma suspect. In fact, some of you might be on this webinar. Glaucoma suspect, uh, other people might call it borderline glaucoma, the very beginning of glaucoma. I like to phrase it as a group of people who carry higher risk of developing glaucoma eventually in your lifetime, but you don't currently have any deficits or defects or problems in your, in your peripheral vision. That does not, if you have the glaucoma suspect diagnosis, that doesn't put you into the complete safe zone. Um, it just means that you need constant monitoring a regular follow-up to make sure your glaucoma risk doesn't increase over time and make you to become a actual glaucoma patient. Normal tension glaucoma is a subtype of primary open angle glaucoma as well. Usually um, at this point, after we talked about glaucoma for a few minutes now, you understand that high eye pressure normally causes nerve damage, hence glaucoma. However, there's a very small percent of people can get glaucoma nerve damage, even when their pressure is within what's considered normal in the common sense. So these type of people, we call them normal tension glaucoma. And there are some people call it the same way, um, low tension glaucoma. All it's saying is your nerve is so special that it's easily damaged even without high eye pressure. Japanese ethnicity is by far the highest risk factor. People who have sleep apnea apnea for people who are tiny, have low blood pressure um, is another, are other risk factors. So if you have glaucoma, you belong to those categories, make sure you ask your doctor if you have normal tension glaucoma. Usually we try to get those people treated a little bit more aggressively to make sure you don't get worse, precisely because your nerve is more fragile to start with. A complete second category of glaucoma is narrow angle glaucoma. I'm sure some of you have the diagnosis of anatomical narrow angle. Angle is the structure I was telling you about earlier as the drainage channel of the eye. So we call it simple angle. So if this angle um, is small, imagine the plumbing piping your her in your house being super tiny. So nothing can get through it very efficiently, then that causes a buildup of um, waste in, in the plumbing system. So in the eye, if the angle is too tiny, nothing drains through it, the fluid doesn't drain through it efficiently, they build up in the eye and cause high eye pressure and end up causing a glaucoma. Another category of glaucoma, I kind of just grouped every other type of glaucoma into this, is called other secondary glaucoma, which would include glaucoma induced by using steroid around your eye long-term. Uh, glaucoma as a result of other eye diseases or surgeries or injuries, glaucoma as a result of systemic inflammation such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, or other inflammatory diseases. So there are many ways people can, can get glaucoma, and every single category of this glaucoma are treated slightly differently. So how do I find out if I have glaucoma? The only sure way to really diagnose glaucoma is with a complete eye exam. I definitely have patients coming to me and say, hey, my pressure is okay. Do I have glaucoma? 
Right, glaucoma is definitely having a, a lot to do with the eye pressure, but eye pressure is certainly not the only factor that eye doctors look at when they screen you for a glaucoma. So um, make sure you don't fixate or only pay attention to the pressure number. Make sure you um, come to all of your follow-up appointments and get all the necessary testing, which um, looks at your nerve thickness, which looks at whether you start to have blind spots in your peripheral vision, if so, how extensive it is, and also looking at the thickness of your cornea and looking at whether your nerve thickness is getting thinner and thinner over time. All of those are super important. Um, if we did all of those tests in one visit, it'll be actually an awful long visit. Nobody would want that. So we tend to, at Harvard Eye, break up your appointments to at least three to four times a year. So we actually have more chances to check your eye pressure to find a trend also. And that would allow us to break all these lengthy exams into different sessions as well. So each visit, visit is done more accurately and, what, and efficiently. And once a year, you should have a dilated eye exam. That's the only best way to look at actually for the doctors to appreciate your optic nerve um, and have a, a impression of whether that has changed from the year prior. So it's important um, to do all of that. I know some of you don't like you know, dilation. Some of you uh, may not plan dilation, but I encourage you to at least get it once a year um, so we can have a good look at your optic nerve. Um, I was alluding to this earlier, there are a lot more than just eye pressure. So at each of your visit, we look at your visual acuity, which is the clarity of your vision. We check your eye pressure, a fancy way of saying that is interocular pressure. We check your cornea thickness. Like I said earlier, the thinner it is, the more underestimation it'll have for your eye pressure. Um, I do an eye exam of your angle at the baseline when I first meet you to see whether your angle is narrow or not narrow. Once you're not narrow, we don't tend to follow your angle more. We assume it'll stay open. Once it's narrow though, we do at least see it every six months to make sure it doesn't continue to get more narrow, which can happen, which then puts you at higher risk of having high pressure in the eye and losing vision. We do a nerve scan, which is a measure, uh, which is basically a, a computer scan to measure the thickness of the nerve. We check your peripheral vision. That's the test where you have a machine giving you um, different signals in your periphery vision. It's not related to your clarity of the vision. Nobody likes that test, they all hate it, but it's the only golden standard to gauge how much vision loss you have in your side vision or peripheral vision. We take a picture of the nerve, of your optic nerve. It's literally think of it as a mugshot of your optic nerve. It's not done to really show any um, difference from uh, months to months or visit to visit. It's a photo that I do every few years so that I can compare to the previous one to see if things are getting worse, whether there's any bleeding on there. It serves more of a documentation purpose. So if I happen to not be there and someone else look at your nerve, they have something to compare to, um, to what they're looking at right now to see if there's a change that should be brought to someone's attention. And then any additional testing that your doctor uh, think might be appropriate. Sometimes we send people for nerve scans of such as CT scan of the brain, MRI scan of the brain, if we suspect to other things other than glaucoma. Not just glaucoma can cause optic nerve uh, damages, other things can too. If your presentation is not typical for glaucoma, but your nerves look weird, we also send you for additional neurology workup to make sure we don't miss anything else potentially more serious. So can you cure a glaucoma? I wish I have a good answer for that, but unfortunately, up until now, this moment, there is no cure for glaucoma yet. There are a ton of study going on around the world to look at nerve regeneration, to look at how we can repair the blind spots that you encounter in glaucoma. But unfortunately, at this present time, nobody has a way to cure glaucoma. So the appropriate treatment, depending upon the type and severity of glaucoma, is um, centered around more like eye drops, lasers, and glaucoma surgeries. Early detection is more important than any other treatment in my mind, because um, since the damage of glaucoma is not repairable, um, I lost a battle already if I catch you in your severe stage. 
You won't think I'm a good doctor because I can't make you better. So the earlier we detect this problem, the more time we have to stop you from getting permanent damage in your vision. So speaking of treatment, the treatment options, including the most traditional way of treating glaucoma, which is eye drops. We have many different types of eye drops, categories of eye drops, different chemicals. So we usually start with the most simple one drop a day regimen. Eventually, if that's not enough to control your eye pressure, we add on a second agent or a third agent. We give you combo drops. Eventually, I'll get to a point that we run out of opt, um, eye drop options. Laser is another way that I typically use to treat glaucoma in the early stage. Yes, you heard me right, in the early stage of glaucoma. In the old days, when um, the laser first came out, we used laser more um, like a surgery. So when drops don't work anymore, we then say, hey, why don't you try this laser? Nowadays, actually a newer study just came out of Europe. I've been telling a lot of my patients, especially new patients, that um, a, lay, um, a study came out of Europe where they actually randomized the group of people, half of them to eye drops, half of them to receiving non-invasive laser procedure called the Selective Laser Trabeculoplasty or SLT laser for short, um, for people who are first diagnosed glaucoma. So you walk into a clinic, they diagnose you of glaucoma, you 50, 50%, it's a flip of a coin, you either do drop or you do laser. Five years later, the laser treatment group actually did better, not only from an eye drop, um, eye pressure maintenance uh, standpoint, but also from preserving the peripheral, peripheral vision standpoint, the laser group actually did better. So since that result, glaucoma specialists have been pushing pretty hard to have people consider doing the non-invasive laser a little sooner in their treatment regimen. But we also understand sometimes, you know, it's hard to have people come around the idea that laser is not invasive. It is a procedure, we have to say, it's not just an eye drop, but because it works so well and the downside of it is literally just mild inflammation and potentially temporary increase in eye pressure, we really think it's worth the minimal risk to consider doing the laser treatment early. Once your eye drop or laser fail you, they're not adequate to control your eye pressure, we also recommend surgery. Thanks to the newer technology in glaucoma development, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery became available. It's a group of procedures, not just one type, it's many different types. It could be stents, it could be catheters, it could be laser, it could be different types of minimally invasive surgeries that we provide people mostly at the same time when you're undergoing cataract surgery. Because glaucoma and cataract are both aging problems, older people tend to get it. We tend to have people who are under treatment for glaucoma eventually end up needing cataract surgery to clear their vision. So at the time of cataract surgery, we utilize that same trip to the operating room, same cataract surgery. We're just adding on a step to the procedure and um, providing glaucoma care. So it's been giving a lot of people good response results, both from a standpoint of lowering their eye pressure and also from a standpoint of lowering their medication burden. So you end up actually using less drops after the glaucoma surgery combined with your cataract surgery. Why not, right? You don't have to remember using all the three, four different bottles you have to use. I have to point out that don't have too high of an expectation, like too unrealistic. If you have severe glaucoma, you're on four different eye drops to control your eye pressure. At the time of cataract surgery, I'm more than happy to provide this minimally invasive glaucoma surgery for you, which in fact I do, but it will not be realistic to get your pressure completely controlled and you use zero drops afterwards. That unfortunately is not something minimally invasive glaucoma surgery can do. If we're looking at to achieve results like that, most of the time we need to do traditional glaucoma surgery, which is definitely incisional. So it's more invasive. It requires providing devices into the eye to help drain the fluid out as a conduit or a, you know, secondary pathway. So that involves blades, sharps, sutures, so higher risk of bleeding and potential infection. 
compared to other major surgery you may get on your joints, on your heart, on your valves, on your brain, this is small surgery. It's not big at all. And the risk of infection and um, bleeding is much, much less from those general surgeries. But compared to everything else we do with the eye, it's slightly higher risk. But those are the four major categories of treatment that we provide for people. So after you've done all of that, you've done the screening, you found out you have glaucoma, you are treated, um, you are using your drops, you did the laser, you had the MIG surgery at the time of cataract surgery, do you still have glaucoma? So these are quotes that I take from people who literally talk to me in my clinic, um, you know, may or may not be before or after their surgery. So I've used medications for the whole month since you started it. I'm very good at using the drops every single night. And you told me my pressure is improved today. Do I still have glaucoma? Well, I have the medication implant in both eyes now. I think I don't need to use the drops anymore and my glaucoma is cured. Do I still have glaucoma? Well, at least to address those two questions about eye drops and medication implant, which is basically an implant that uh, uh, releases eye drop medication in your eye over time, the answer is yes, you still have glaucoma. Remember what I said, the saddest thing about glaucoma at the beginning is there is no cure for glaucoma. Glaucoma is something we manage, like your diabetes. You take medication or insulin or you eat well and exercise to control it. Like your heart problems, you take your beta blockers, you take your high blood pressure medications to manage that. Like your you know, atrial fibrillation, it can be controlled with a pacemaker, but it doesn't completely go away. So the word we use for glaucoma is, is it controlled? It's not something I can completely remove from you, unfortunately, still at this present time. The so same goes if you tell me, I had the laser done a few years ago by a different doctor and my pressure got lower afterwards. He said, I don't have glaucoma anymore. Why again? Well, because you never actually stopped having glaucoma. Your pressure was controlled. That's correct. And your glaucoma probably stopped getting worse, but you still have it. In other words, the nerve damage you sustained from those years you had high pressure is there. There's nothing we could do to repair it. The battle really focuses on going forward. We don't lose more nerve fibers to glaucoma or high eye pressure. So why do I have to do this visual field test again? My pressure is better. I thought you took care of it with the cataract surgery. Correct. So cataract surgery reduces eye pressure if we combine minimally invasive glaucoma procedure at the same time. But afterwards, that doesn't mean your glaucoma is cured. Glaucoma cannot be cured. I'm saying it probably for the thousands time today. Glaucoma is still there. We still need to monitor it. We want to still maintain your visits to make sure your pressure is still in check. And we have the chance to run all the different testing I was explaining to you guys earlier to make sure it's a controlled and not getting worse. Last month, my pressure got up really high and I had to have a glaucoma surgery. Now the pressure is better. I don't have glaucoma anymore, right? Again, that's not a true statement. Yes, glaucoma surgery, such in the form of implants or tube shunts or Zen gel stents that you might tell me or you might have had or hurt friends getting it. Those are ways to, again, control eye pressure. Your eye pressure can be controlled by these procedures without a doubt but that doesn't mean your glaucoma is cured. We cannot cure a glaucoma. We still need to monitor that. I definitely feel sad when I lose patients after they have done their surgery thinking the glaucoma is taken care of. I thank them for having such a confidence in me and thinking the glaucoma is cured, but I can't. I can control your eye pressure. I still need to see you periodically to make sure the, sh the pressure remains controlled and we don't need to do additional stuff. People would ask me, why? glaucoma continue to get worse if you say the pressure is controlled? Great question. Remember, the highest risk factor for glaucoma is aging. Once you get older, which happens every single day, unfortunately, your eye structure and your eye function deteriorates. So say you got your cataract glaucoma surgery at the age of 80, and it's controlled. By the time you turn 90, that's 10 years after, Everything else in the body deteriorates. What made you think the eye won't, right? The eye will continue to deteriorate as well. The part of it that was controlled by the glaucoma surgery will remain controlled, 
but the part that was okay and didn't have an issue now may start to have issue. So you will have new issue on top of what it was before dealt with the surgery. So at that point, you may need additional drops or additional revision of the surgery or additional surgery altogether to continue to maintain your eye pressure. I have the laser done on my iris where they poked holes. They said I would never get glaucoma again. So some of you, if you have narrow angle, or if you have, you know, angle closure glaucoma, that's the procedure you may get. That's the laser you may get called the LPI or um, peripheral airdectomy laser. That's a laser we use to literally poke holes on the iris. This laser is destructive, so it disrupts tissue and burns holes on the iris. It's done that to, to provide a emergency exit to the eye. If in the very rare event where your natural drainage angle just um, completely collapse and unable to provide the function of draining fluid, there is this little emergency exit that we put uh, manually on the from the laser onto the iris to serve as a back door. So you don't get overcrowded in um, the uh, drainage angle, which isn't working already and have high pressure. So you can still continue to get glaucoma even that's done because the angle is a dynamic structure. It continue, it can, especially as we get older and the cataract grow in size, it can actually make the angle more and more narrow to a point that emergency hole is not big enough to control all that problem with the pressure and end up having scarring and causing more glaucoma in this case. So you can still get glaucoma even after the laser air death debate. I'm not saying everybody would, the majority of the people probably don't, but you still need to have regular follow-up maybe twice a year or at least once a year to make sure it doesn't happen to you. So what I'm trying to say is regardless of the type of glaucoma, regular follow-up to monitor for any progression is crucial. And at the visits, you will have your eye pressure checked, your field of vision or peripheral vision checked. You'll have photos taken for your nerve y'all have the scan of the nerve to measure the thickness. Um, and if the doctor decides that your nerve is getting thinner or if um, your visual field is getting more restricted or your eye pressure, frankly, is just going up, that's a point where they will decide we need to add more drops or it's time to consider laser, laser treatment or even surgery if um, some of the factors we monitor is getting worse. So for those of you at the end um, looking for innovations, um, SLT is the one that I was telling you earlier that shows great results in um, treating glaucoma. Um, if you're first diagnosed with glaucoma, deciding between starting eye drops, which is a lifetime commitment versus doing a laser um, treatment, the laser we choose is called selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT. This is a laser that's been out there for decades. It's not some invention we just started having. Um, however, a group of us, a glaucoma specialist, um, uh, is conducting a clinical trial. This is a trial that's um, spearheaded by the National Eye Institute, um, and that has maybe 20 centers that are enrolling patients around the country, us Harvard Eye being one of the only, actually the only Southern California site that's um, actively recruiting patients. Another one in California would be UC Davis. This is a clinical trial named POST trial. Basically, we're trying to see if we can use this laser. Again, it's been there, proven working effectively in a safer and more effective ways. We want to apply the laser to an eye that's never been treated with drops or laser before and can use it at a lower energy level or maybe repeat it every year. I've been telling my patients who's interested in this trial that think of it as a car, right? Your car, you need to take it into the shop for maintenance every few uh, uh, hundred miles or you know, every six months or something, sometimes even more frequent than that for an oil change. So this is what we envision the laser can do for your eye is to actually do maintenance laser every year annually to repeat it and maybe, um, prevent you or stop you from having to use drops for a longer time. So if you're interested, if you are newly diagnosed with glaucoma, is still on the fence about what's the best treatment for you, um, you're more than welcome to come get a consultation with me and see if you're a good candidate for this trial. 
And also another take home point I want you guys to, to uh, take home is that there are less than very invasive glaucoma surgeries, such as the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery that can be provided at the time of cataract surgery. So make sure when it comes to time for your cataract surgery, if you also have glaucoma, ask them whether a mix or minimally microinvasive glaucoma surgery is appropriate. There are stents out there, there are goniotomy or uh, channel, uh, channel cleaning procedures that we can provide maybe laser procedures that we do in the operating room, slightly more invasive than the SLT laser that can be provided at the time of your cataract surgery to provide you better service in taking care of your glaucoma at the same time. This is more geared towards people who have a milder form of glaucoma, so mild to moderate stage. And it not only can help you have lower pressure, and if you're on more than one drop, or even just one drop, it might get you to a point where you don't have to remember using your drops every day. Um, after, so if you're one of those who already had cataract surgery, you ask me whether that's still a boat you can get on. Yes. So even for those who got their cataract surgery done already, there's a small percent of the mix procedure that can still be performed in these people. This um, decision, whether these surgeries is appropriate for cataract surgery or after cataract surgery, is not really based on its medical effectiveness. This is purely centered around what FDA approved the procedure to be done. So the majority of them can only be done at the time of cataract surgery per FDA regulation, if you, so, which means your insurance will pay for it. If you decide that you want it, but your insurance won't pay for it, you can still pay cash in order to get it done, but it obviously it's less convenient. And so um, a small group of those microinvasive glaucoma surgery or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery can still be done as a standalone procedure for people who's already gotten their cataract surgery um, years ago. So um, in, uh, over the course of last year, I've given other um, talks about a glaucoma. So these are the title of some of them, including, you know, dropless version of treating glaucoma, which focuses on talking about the different laser options we kind of alluded to tonight, as well as the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. We have a talk about glaucoma emergencies and an earlier one to talk about, you know, more general terms of what glaucoma is um, and what new drops and treatment options are available. Those are all on our YouTube channel. You can always email Michael or Erica in our marketing department to um, get a copy of that um, and have access. So um, basically take home points, right? Common eye disease can impact people who are older without you, know, without you knowing that there is a problem. So get a comprehensive eye exam at least once a year if you're in that um, category, age category. Make sure we work together pre to preserve your vision, not only from a glaucoma standpoint, but just from a general eye health standpoint, okay? We here at Harvard Eye, myself, and other cataract surgeons, glaucoma specialists, our retina specialists are always here. We welcome you, you know, to get all um, screening exams or if you have second opinions and consultations you want to hear from, you know, different doctors just to get a different perspective, we definitely welcome you to do that. I think that's the end of the talk. Michael, I can um, answer some questions you have some there. Yeah, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. And so feel free to go ahead and use the chat function or the Q&A function. We typically find that the raise hand function is, is a little spotty at times. So the question and answer or the chat function work great. Um, like Dr. Wong said, our YouTube channel at Harvard Eye Associates is always great. Um, a great resource if you have questions about glaucoma, cataracts, retina, you name it, there are videos um, on that channel. Um, that can provide some uh, information as well. Um, also, if you are interested uh, in the clinical trial that Dr. Wong was talking about, I did go ahead and in the chat, I did provide our clinical studies coordinator, Lonnie Nguyen, her email address. Um, so she is a great resource as well if you do have questions about qualifications or anything like that. So um, with that said, it does likely have a couple of questions. Um, First of which is, can glaucoma drops cause problems with drainage of the tear ducts uh, and cause watery eyes? I'm sorry, say that question again. I didn't, uh, uh, it kind of just dropped out. Yeah, yeah, can glaucoma drops cause problems with drainage or uh, of the tear ducts and cause watery eyes? Yeah, so a uh, good question. 
Um, there is a, a, all glaucoma drops, unfortunately, can potentially irritate the surface of the eye. Um, when you have watery eyes, it's not necessarily because your tear duct is blocked and the tear isn't draining efficiently. It actually could be that your eye is activating a protective mechanism where it's trying to, quote, flush out all that medication from the surface of your eye to save you from the irritation. So it's actually making more steer, um, a tear to try to do that, which in your perspective might be, you know, the tear duct not working. So it's irritation. If you have irritation, severely bothered by the irritation from one of the glaucoma drops, we can always try a different type or different category altogether. Everybody responds to different drops differently. So it really takes a trial and error to find out which one your eye agrees to the most. And while we're on the subject of drops, is there a cheaper drop than Lumigan? Uh, and if so, what would you recommend? Yeah, Lumigan is a brand name medication, so it is on the higher end. There are definitely generic versions of or similar cousins to Lumigan. So um, definitely ask your doctor. You can simply ask them to provide a generic equivalent of Lumigan, and they can easily do that for you. Wonderful. And then what are the risks with SLT uh, and particularly when there are repeated treatments? Yeah, great question. So uh, the two most common uh, problems with SLT laser is number one, increased inflammation, which people will feel a severe ache in their eye, but that's self-limited. One, it's actually, uh, think of it as, um, as a good sign. What we're trying to do with the SLT laser is to have the eye absorb laser energy and the cells actually at a cellular level is supposed to use that energy to rejuvenize the little structures they have inside and actually rebuild that pump system to work better. So that process involves inflammation. So if you feel like your eye is achy, swollen, swelling, it's actually the eye undergoing that changing process. It, that's why it's self-limited. In very, very rare cases, we need to put people on anti-inflammatory drops to limit the, um, uh, the inflammation, which we don't really want to temper net too much because we like it to rejuvenize your whole drainage angle. So that's number one. Number two is people can tend to have slightly elevated eye pressure right after the laser, usually happens 30 minutes right after the laser, which is why we keep you after your treatment for about 30 minutes to make sure your pressure is good before we send you home. But those are the two main problems. Since we're doing it at a lower energy, we really have not seen in trials, people have these common side effects more frequent. In fact, it's actually less frequent. Um. Can glaucoma cause color saturation? Uh, if somebody has trouble distinguishing objects that are really close in color, is that is that a potential uh, outcome when, when you have glaucoma? Perfect question. So I think what you're trying to say is contrast sensitivity decrease. That's actually a very keen observation. It tends to have happen all the time in people of moderate to severe level of glaucoma. So what you're saying is if you put a light scale of gray on top of a white background, you may not see it or like a different shades of pink, you can't tell the difference. That's called decreased contrast sensitivity. So you're not seeing the contrast between very close color. So that's a common thing. It's when nerve actually loses its function, the first thing, believe it or not, it gives away is contrast sensitivity and not clarity. Um, and then uh, with regards to the clinical trial, if somebody uh, happened to be placed on uh, Zyoptan drops uh, almost a year ago, um, would that dis uh, disclude them for qualifying for the clinical trial? Right. So the requirement for the clinical trial is never been treated for glaucoma um, on any type of eye drops, number one, or um, a linear kind of uh, trying to include more people and, and have this like benefit, benefit more people is if you've been put on a uh, drop remotely long time ago, I think, uh, I don't call me on this, but Lonnie will be able to provide more precise answer, but it's within the past three years that you've never been treated, then you still qualify. But if anything more recent than that, unfortunately, no, you can't. Um, is it possible if somebody has a severe middle ear infection uh, in the right ear and needs surgery for the ear, um, and then the right ear is in the process of glaucoma, are they connected and could they influence each other? Usually not.
can glaucoma decrease night vision? Yeah, that's a, it's another uh, common finding of um, glaucoma. It, it actually for the same reason, the contrast sensitivity decrease. Because pretty much at night, everything's a grayscale. It's not, it's kind of black and white, right? There's no much color to it when it's dark. So um, yeah, contrast sensitivity is what we use to distinguish objects. Um, why are you no longer a candidate for SLT if you are already on Lumigan? You are a candidate for SLT despite um, being on any drops, one, two, three, or four. You can still get SLT treatment if you have drops. What you don't qualify for is this particular clinical trial. And that's just by design. It's a design that we designed the trial to only look at people who's never been treated or we call it prima naive. In the future, may, we may enroll people who's been treated with drops before, but the first step is trying to see if there is no other quote noise or other drops that's helping, uh, whether the SLT will do what we think it'll do. Looks like we have a couple of more questions and I do see some questions that are a little bit more in depth um, and might need a little bit of back and forth conversation. So I have, um, for those of you who have provided those questions, I have made note of them, I assure you that, um, and I can provide them to Dr. Wong um, after the webinar concludes, because I do suspect that they'll, they'll require some follow-up and kind of a little bit of a longer conversation. Um, right. So I do, um, I, I do want to, yeah. Absolutely, Michael, you can send those to me, but I, I think I'm seeing one uh, kind of like just a summary of it in yeah. the Q&A session. Um, but that one, it looks like it's better if we actually have a consultation because it, it yeah. looks like it may involve a lot of record reviewing and very specific. So I, unfortunately, we can't answer you know questions in a general term when we don't really know the complicated history of um, the eye without making any answer that's, you know, um, that's medically sound. So I do, I, I do have your, your information um, in your email. So I, I will go ahead and reach out and put the two of you uh, in connection with, with Dr. Wong so we can go ahead um, and discuss that a little bit, like you said, more at length outside of, um, outside of the webinar. Great, um, great. Yeah, and having said that, it doesn't look like we have any more questions as of the moment. Um, so before we sign off uh, and we... We put the first webinar of the year in the books. Any last words, Dr. Wong, that you'd like to end tonight's seminar on? Oh yeah, um, that's it. For those of you who didn't get your answers um, uh, tonight, I, I think it's because it's too um, uh, medically specific. It does require you know consultation to do that, and uh, we welcome you to come uh, schedule an appointment with me or you know uh, request records. And so going that route, um, unfortunately, we we can't do uh, your answer here. Um, but for the rest of you, I thank you all for spending this, you know, hour with us to do this webinar. I hope this talk actually made you more aware of glaucoma and its treatment and um, wish all of your glaucoma don't get worse. And um, if you want to get a second opinion or you want to come see me, you're more than welcome to schedule an appointment through our just uh, appointment desk or a uh, phone room. Otherwise, you guys have a good rest of the evening and happy new year again. And as well, if you have any, if like I say, this happens to me all the time, if any questions do populate after we've concluded the webinar, you can always feel free to reach us uh, out to us afterwards. We are more than happy to sit down with each and every person um, and answer their questions um, if, if they are to arise later. So um, we do thank you for joining us tonight. We, and we appreciate you being with, with us whenever we conduct these webinars, um, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.